Hi guys, how are we doing? It's Dan Hancock here, the Mental Health PT, and welcome to another episode of the Truth Be Told podcast, where I'm joined by the amazing Keegan Hurst, who opens up all about his life. He tells us about how he made it as a rugby star, how he struggled to come to terms with the fact that he was gay in his youth, and how really a lack of acceptance of who he was really started to shape and mould his life initially in a way that he didn't want, and now in a way that he is extremely proud of. It's an extremely touching, but also very funny podcast and I really hope that you enjoy it. Before we get stuck in, as a disclaimer, there are some subjects in this podcast that may be sensitive to listeners. Because the subject revolves around mental health, depression and we even touch on suicide, we would ask all listeners to appreciate that all views held are unique and individual to Keegan Hurst and based on his own personal experiences. Besides that guys, I hope you enjoy this podcast. I absolutely love filming it and recording it with Keegan. Hope you enjoy. Hi guys, how are we doing? Welcome to another Truth Be Told podcast. I'm joined by the amazing, amazing, amazing Keegan Hurst today. Um, I'm very, very, very privileged to have Keegan within my inner circle of um, business associates, but also um, would, would consider him as a good friend now as well. So I'm really, really glad that he's came to speak to us today. So Keegan, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to just introduce yourself and for anyone who doesn't know you, uh, tell the guys a little bit about you. Thank you, mate. I am the Amegan Keegan Hurst. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, I'm Keegan Hurst. I am a, a coach. I work with gay guys. Um, I've been a professional homosexual myself. Um, I am a former professional rugby league player. Did that for 15 years. Um, I came out uh, when I was about 27 while I was still playing, um, which ended up becoming a bit of a thing. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I used to, I was married to a woman. I got two kids. There's, you know, there's lots of lots of layers to peel back during this podcast. But um, yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell, mate. Where the fuck do we start? <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's run through a couple of questions. We'll get the audience again who doesn't know you. I'm sure a lot of people will, majority will listening. Um, let's find out a little bit more about you. So, God, we'll be here all day. What are you most proud of in your lifetime? Um, <laughs> difficult. There's been a few things. Um, I'm not prepped, Keegan, on this. <laughs> I gave him no I, pre warning. <laughs> I would, I would say where I'm at at the minute with regards to how I feel about who I am, um, my kids, my mission in life, what I want to achieve. Feeling comfortable in my own skin for a long, long time. That wasn't the case. Um, and you know, I've achieved a lot of things professionally and and things like that. But for me that has probably been the biggest battle that I've had in my life. So I would say where I'm at at the minute, I'm feeling really good about who I am, what I bring to the world, kids are healthy, happy, that kind of thing. Yeah, amazing. So that, that self-acceptance, but then purpose as well. Like so, yeah. so alive. yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we, so many of us go through life in general, <sighs> think, why am I here? What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? You know, for me, a big thing growing up has been, and in and in a dialogue and in a battle, I guess, has been who are, who am I supposed to be versus who I actually am, and they've, they've always kind of butted heads. Whereas now I'm at a point in my life, or have been for a, a while, but certainly feel really good about it now. Where they're not, they're the same thing. Who who I am and and what I expect of myself is, I, I know what that is, and I don't worry about what other people expect of me. I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, so that that's been a big thing for me. Yeah, I love it. Amazing. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, what's your biggest regret, if you have one? Um, you know, I, I've been asked this many times. Obviously, we've we've coming out. I got I got married to a woman. Um, I guess, and I wouldn't say that it, it, as as daft as it might sound, people might think, oh, well, you shouldn't have done that. But then I won't have the kids, so I don't I don't regret that. I guess my regret is not being. I don't know, not being able to accept who I was when I was a kid or or even, no, do you know what? Because that wasn't necessarily my fault. It was how I grew up. So I guess my regret is where, where I grew up and how I was brought up and the, uh, not I'm slagging my mum off, um, <laughs> but, the, you know, the environment that I was brought up in and, and, and how that, you know, we were just talking there about limiting beliefs um, and that really capped what I thought 
I was and who I could be. So I guess that'd be my biggest regret, but it's not necessarily something that I've done. I've done many things drunken that I, I probably <laughs> forget as a rugby player, but um, I, I'm going to say that I don't remember those. <laughs> So we'll come back full circle. We'll go into this in a little bit as well. Um, what is your favourite type of food? All of it. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> six, I'm six foot four, 120 odd kilos. Like I'm not, um, you don't get to be this big by being picky with food. Um, yeah, a big Sunday dinner though. I'd love, I'd, I'd have a massive Sunday dinner every day. That'd be my go-to. Nice, love it. Um, what's your favourite boy band? Difficult question. Um, I've never really been a boy band person. I, I, I would I would probably say One Direction because <laughs> because uh, my daughter like loved them growing up, and I do genuinely do genuinely think what makes you beautiful is an incredibly well written pop song. <laughs> I love how you flung the daughter under the bus there. That was <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Operation Human Shield. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So apologies in advance if this is a really cliche question that you feel as a gay guy you might get asked. But I think it is important and it's going to open up the dialogue of what we're going to discuss going forward. Now, we've mentioned about the environment that you grew up in and how that could have been a key reason for you not feeling accepted or feeling that you could be yourself or or even come out when did you when did you first realize again apologies in advance i know it's a bit of a cliche but when did you first get inclinations that you that you were gay and then when did you sort of really realize that this is who you are yeah yeah um it's it's funny because i've been asked this question at different points in my life i've probably given numerous different answers so <laughs> Hindsight is a, is a wonderful thing. So I suppose looking back, I probably knew that there was something going on when I was about 12, 13, yeah. um, you know, seeing fancying boys at school. <laughs> so much so that I remember, you know, when lads would be talking about girls that they fancy and it was like, when we were kids, there was like Nuts magazine and there was <laughs> stuff like that. The, the, the OG, the original. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they were talking about all these girls and I had absolutely no idea who they're talking about. And they said, Keegan, who do you fancy? And I said, Carol Vorderman. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't know what the correct answer was. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought, at the time I kind of thought I fancied lads but no one's really talking about it so maybe everybody's doing it but we're just not talking about it I didn't know if I was weird I, I, so that was when I probably had the first kind of inclination about it when I actually came to accept it god literally 27 years old after uh -huh. being married having two kids uh struggling with you know grow I grew up in a town in in the north of England in, in Yorkshire it was like everybody knew everybody's business everybody there were no gay people at all. Certainly there was, for me, gay people were Elton John, they were Freddie Mercury, they were like very out there. And that was like, I was a geeky fat kid at school. Um, I I liked reading, I liked, I, I wasn't sport. <laughs> I, was, I was so crap at sports. I didn't, um, even though I went on to be a professional athlete, I was so crap at sports that I didn't even pick it at GCSE. I did music and history. Um, <laughs> and I played the trombone, which I appreciate. There's a lot of irony there. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't like your typical kid who, who becomes a professional athlete who was like always loved sport and always into it. I got into rugby by accident. I just got kind of the local coach came and picked me up one day from school where they pulled up outside. He was like, get in the car. I thought, oh my God, this is the stranger. Come to Mad Axe murder me. Um, my mum told me it was, it was the coach. I went and I played rugby and I was shit at it. But I loved it. I loved the camaraderie of it. I loved that we were all trying to achieve the same thing. I'd never really had that before because um, I didn't play out much. Yeah, I'd rather read a book. So that was my, even though I was shit at it, I stuck with it. Um, and I didn't get good at it until I was about 16. Puberty was very good to me. And then, so being in that environment as a rugby player, growing up in the north of England, my mum always hammered home, you grow up, you get a job, you get married, you have kids on repeat. That was like what you did. And, and so that was hammered into me and any strain away from that. I think I had like grand visions of going to university and getting a job in a suit was my idea when I was when I was younger but I it, yeah I didn't so growing up in that environment 
So I met my um, ex-wife when I was 19. We'd been seeing each other for three months and then she was pregnant with my daughter. Wow. I, my, I'd, never met, I'd never met my dad. I've never met my dad. Sorry, present tense. I've still never met him. Um, so I, I always was very aware that, and I suppose because I'd struggled with my sexuality, and at that time I was kind of like, it's going to go away. You, these are going to just go away. You just it's a, it's a phase. It's a thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll go away kind of thing. So it wasn't something that was always present, but I was very aware of it and I thought it'll go away. And I always thought that because my dad wasn't around, that was why I thought like this, that was having an impact on me. And I thought, I don't want my kids to doubt who they are because their dad's not around anyway. So I did, I did what I thought was doing the right thing. We got, we got together, we stayed together. And, and, you know, I was doing all right at rugby. I was playing, uh, as a kid, I'd come up through the ranks at, at Bradford Bulls, which at the time was like Man City, what, what Man City are. Now they're like the best of the best. The, the, all the academy structure changed. I ended up going to play part, uh, part-time rugby, but with actual men. I was like 18 years old and I was playing proper rugby with 30-odd-year-old blokes. It's terrifying. Um, and so I was doing that. I was working as, an, as a joiner, as an apprentice and I had a young family. So I had like, on the outside, it probably looked really, really good. I was struggling with, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing by my kid? Am I lying to, to Sarah? Am I, do you, do you know, there was all that kind of inner turmoil going on. Am I actually gay? Well, I mean, I would never actually internalize, internally ask that question for me. It was impossible that I was gay, but it was like, there's something going on here. And as that went on, as, as you know, Dan, with mental health, if you don't fucking, deal with it it just festers and it gets worse and worse and worse and that's that's kind of what happened and I got to a point where I, I just thought I can't I can't do this anymore but I didn't know what to do because I thought I'm trapped this is what I've got this is what I'm supposed to do this is what men do they get married they have kids and they provide for them I can't I can't not do that what you know for me it was literally I'm very all or nothing it was that or I genuinely thought about suicide and then I thought I can't leave my kid that's the whole point I'm here in the first place Sarah wanted to get married. So I was like, you just got to fucking suck it up. You know, rugby would talk about being mentally tough. And it was like, you just got to suck it up. So we got married. We had another kid. Um, we bought a house. There was lots going on. So like I was, my time was completely full. I didn't have any time to think about a, a, anything that was going on with me. And then as that settled down a bit, it was, it was like, the only way I can describe it is, you know, when you need the loo and then it goes away and then it comes back with a vengeance later on. <laughs> yeah. it, but Great it, analogy. Yeah. It was like that, but in my head. And I was like, I, I, I was in a really bad spot. Like I was drinking loads. I was taking drugs. Rugby was suffering. I was horrendous to be around. And I didn't, I tried to stay away from home as much as possible. I had an awful relationship with the kids. I didn't like myself. And again, I thought, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to drive out. I'm going to get a horse pipe and I'm just going to see you later. And I literally, I, I was like, literally, you know, it was, the, I was going to do it the day I was going to do it. And then the kids, I just kind of saw the kids and I was like, you know, if I die, the kids will never know why, you know, maybe Sarah will think she's done something wrong. And, and really all they'd ever done was put up with me. And it got to a point where his relationship was becoming really shit. And I just thought, I can't do that. And I can't continue in this relationship because I don't want my kids growing up thinking this is what a relationship is. So we split up when I was like 27. And with that kind of came, you know, comes a bit of perspective, comes a bit of distance. And that was when I kind of came to terms with, all right, there's something going on here, you know, you, you're gay. Like, and it, it was like an internal thing. And it, I kind of came to accept it, I suppose, because I was out of this marriage and, and things like that. And then I was like, oh, that's good. You're not a complete arsehole then. Um, you know, there's a reason behind it. But then it was also terrifying. What the fuck are you going to do about it? You know, you've got, are you going to tell Sarah? Are you going to tell the kids? Are you going to tell rugby? Are you going to do anything about it? So I was like, I've got to, I can't like carry this around. I've been carrying that around for ages. So, and at the time I really struggled to act, like I really struggled to accept it so much so that I couldn't actually say I'm gay out loud. It would literally kind of stick in my throat. So I thought I need to tell Sarah that has to be the first person. And I, and because I couldn't say it, I said, I kind of like lads. It was a very weird conversation, very surreal. Um, she, she was all right. Then understandably later on, she, she got angry. I told yeah. my mom. She was, she lives abroad. She did not take it well. I was a disappointment. How could I do this to her? All that kind of stuff. I was like, fucking hell, this is not going well. And then I told the rugby lads and they were amazing, like really supportive. My best mate uh, cried 
he was like, I can't believe you've gone through this on your own. Yeah. Um, which I was, I was like, all right, laying it on a bit thick. Um, no, it wasn't really. It was like amazing. Um, and then I told the coach, the coach was like, I was captain at the time. The coach was like a 60 odd year old bloke. And I was like, fuck, you know, this could be it here. Like, it could be a career over or whatever. I don't know how he's going to react. And he'd said, um, you're a rugby player and you're my captain and whatever else you are doesn't matter to me. Um, and I was like, I'm going to be all right. The club were amazing. So everybody who needed to know knew, and I was like, I'm okay with that. Then the the news, the, it went around like rugby league players can't hold their own piss. So it went around like it was gossip. It wasn't like an issue. It wasn't a thing. It was yeah, just were like, you were you okay? Were you okay with that? Did yeah, you- I was okay with that because everybody like the people that I needed to know knew, so it was fine. Yeah. Then uh, the the coach said the news. He did a lot of media work, and he said the newspapers are going to run a story on it, and I just want you to know. So I kind of got in touch with the newspaper because I thought I'm going through a divorce. I've got two kids. I really don't want anything like salacious in there or whatever. So I did an interview with them and it ended up being front page of the Sunday Mirror. Honestly, like my Twitter blew up. Um, I had messages from famous as um, Emma Watson, Anthony Cotton, Ian McKellen. I had a phone call from Elton John. Um, like, it, it was like it was the most surreal thing I was on Good Morning Britain I was doing interviews here there and everywhere <laughs> can, we, can, I, can we interject just for one second can you just give us a little bit more details on the El- Elton John story because I love this yeah uh, so uh, <laughs> I was actually it was the Monday I got a phone call from a woman it was a London phone number um, and she said she was out and John's assistant. Could she pass my details on? I was like, yeah, of course you are. Anyway, then I got a phone call from, and it, you know where it says where the call's from on your phone? It said from from Nice. And I, I genuinely thought it was PPI. <laughs> so, I think, <laughs> so I ignored it. And then I was like, PPI out ringing from Nice. Are they? So I, called, I, I don't know what made me do it, but I called it back. And I said, I've had a missed call from this number. It was a French guy, obviously. And he was like, oh, just give us a second in a French accent. And then... Uh, it, it connected to another line and then it went hi Keegan Elton here David and I have read the story we think you're absolutely fabulous and then I was like oh, fucking hell um, so I had a conversation I had like a 10 minute conversation with him it was really nice he said you know the world's changing people like you were helping it change it was like a really lovely thing and then we, we we've we stayed in contact we, we swap emails every so often wow. and um, his kids are the same age as mine and you know, it, it, it was very sweet. It was very, I felt like I got a lot of support from established people in the gay community, which I wasn't very aware of at the time of like, I suppose the whole structure and community and, and, and aspect of it. And because I still wasn't fully comfortable with it. Um, so yeah, so I was kind of thrust into this position of, you know, I, I started getting loads of messages then uh, about people who would who'd been married or were married, people who'd stopped playing sport because they were gay, people who were playing sport but weren't out, people, you know, it's, it, I got messages, I got some, I've still got them, like I got letters writ, written by 50, 60, 70 year old guys who'd never come out and said I never wow. had a role model and uh, things like that. And it was like, because I, I remember saying at the time, I don't want to be some kind of poster boy for this. I'm dealing with a fucking divorce and I really don't need the hassle. Thank you very much. And then when I got that all through and I realised, you know, I've been given some kind of notoriety and some kind of voice, not that I'm saying that I represent all gay people or anything like that, but I have a, a voice to speak for certain people. If I don't do that, then, I, you know, I, 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 it didn't sit well with me that. So that kind of forced me into uh, you get your head around it kind of thing. And that, so I would say, you know, it's probably, I'm 33 now, I came out when I was 27. You know, it was probably it's probably only the last three years where I've been really comfortable with it. I remember once, but, but, you know, for me, that self-acceptance, then I ended up playing the best rugby in my career. I got signed to play the Super <laughs> League. I, you know, it opened up so many opportunities for me. I, but, you know, talking about that self-acceptance thing, even though I was out and I was in that public, I remember once being on a trip and I was reading a book. Um, for me, I, 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 like I said, I had really good support network and I had what was called the education um, <laughs> where, you, you know, I was taught about, gay history, gay culture, gay influence. Like there's so many the stuff that you, we don't get taught about at school, you know, Stonewall riots, how the rights movement started, um, you know, culture. There's a secret language. Nobody knows the secret language called Polari that um, gay men used to speak. 
Uh, not many people speak it now, but uh, anyway, so stuff like that, I've, me being the geek that I am, I found all that really interesting. I was just, and I was reading a book while I was with the rugby lads who were completely fine with it. Every team that I played for were completely fine with me being gay. Um, I think I was probably the only gay guy that a lot of them knew. So it was like token. Um, <laughs> token gay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was reading a book that had two, ga- two guys kissing on the front. And I remember being in the airport and, and being suddenly becoming really conscious of it and then closing it and putting it under my arm. And I was like, oh, fuck, you know, I, I still wasn't comfortable with who I was and what, you know. So it's taken a while to get there. So, yeah, uh, that is a very, very long winded answer of, you know, <laughs> when I first realized to the, the the full scale of the acceptance. But, you know, people struggle with who they are and things. To, so for me, that's taken, what, 20 years to get to that point. Uh, but yeah, uh, does that answer the question? <laughs> and more. <laughs> no, but th- but that's it. And I think what, because I've, every, every single thing, thing that you've said, I've been like, right, I, I want to know more about this. I want to know more about this. But I think this, it's just such a good thing. There's just there's so much depth to this. There's just so much that you've been through. And I think for me, what it comes down to, you touched on it towards the end, it's the, it's the self-acceptance. Like what happened when you were able to finally accept yourself for who you are? your whole life changed. I'm not to say that, and it's not that, oh, like you've got some notoriety and that's what's important. It's not that at all, but you had a purpose and you had your vision, which links into exactly what it is that you're doing now. Like you don't want to be maybe the face of, you know, the the first English male um, professional rugby player that came out as gay. That might not be yet, but it's this, this is your vision now and this is your purpose in order to help other, other people. So it, how important do you think Obviously, you went through some traumatic stuff. You went through some really difficult stuff that we wouldn't wish on anyone, especially the the story that you mentioned about going out in the drive in the car when you thought that maybe enough was enough. Has that served a purpose and served a role in where you are now? And would you change you going through that, knowing how this has now built you as a, per- a person and you could potentially be helping other people now? Yeah, 100% no. And obviously, when you're going through it at the time, you think, God, I don't want this to happen. And it's like, you know, people, there are so many people who have amazing stories. My clients have amazing stories. People I speak to have amazing stories. You know, those guys who wrote me those letters have amazing stories. And people say to me, oh, you've, you've, come, you've overcome so much. And, but for me, it's just my life. You know, you, you have an option. You either curl up in a ball or you get on with it. And, and, and for me, that was what I had to do. But yeah, it's absolutely served a purpose. I, I suppose as I got towards the end of my rugby career, I didn't feel fulfilled by it anymore. It felt, you know, it didn't, I felt like I'd achieved everything that I could achieve. I wasn't the best rugby player. You know, I, I, I wasn't good enough to play international. I played at, you know, the highest league, you know, Super League but in a decent team. But I, I wasn't, I, I never professed to be, you know, the best, like I, I missed out or anything like that. I didn't. But what going through all that has done is, and the that journey that you just spoke about there of that self-acceptance I've now come through that other side of that and now for me I feel like my potential what I'm able to achieve the impact that I'm able to have on my my own life my family's life my client's life my, anybody who I interact with I feel like I'm able to 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 give my all to that and you know, I, I don't feel like I'm held back. And I feel like going through the journey that I've gone through has allowed me to do that, which has then given me that that vision and that, you know, what I've created with what my coaching program is, is to create an environment where other people can go through what I went through, to have someone believe in you, to have somebody show you that it's okay, to have somebody accept you for who you are, flaws and all, to show you that you're not stuck where you're at, that things can be better, and to, to, you know, my, my mate, Anthony, who kind of has been, you know, there for me throughout, has, has always said, you know, I just, you just never had anybody to hold you up. And, you know, for me, that's what I try to do with, with my clients is just to, to show that there is a better option. There is a, there is a better way. You don't have to stay stuck. You don't have to, you, you, you are worthy, I think is the, I never felt good enough. I've never felt worthy enough. I never felt like I deserved success or perceived success that I had because I didn't accept that I was a, a good person I was okay I was normal in inverted commas and other so many and that's not necessarily a gay thing I know as 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 gay people or even LGBT people you people do have there's that extra layer of it but you know I, I've had plenty of I've got plenty of straight mates who fucking struggle with 
being okay with who they are and what they want in life and what they value and what they, it's not a sexuality thing. It's a human being thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, what I've gone through has allowed me to see that with like real clarity. And, and if I would have heard me talk five years ago, I would have said he is talking absolute shit. <laughs> um, hippy dippy bullshit. Who, uh, who does he think he is? He's, he's mental. Um, to have it like to have the conviction that I've got, but now I just genuinely, I, I've lived it and I believe it and I breathe it and I see other people do it as well. It's not a one-off thing. Yeah, it's it's huge and it's this whole thing again. It, it just comes back to self-acceptance and like on my end, like when I grew up, I was very, I had a brilliant upbringing, very privileged upbringing, but I didn't know who I was. I didn't have identity. I'm very very fortunate that I haven't been through anything myself that I would consider poor mental health I feel as if I've went through the exact same things that a lot of young people go through you know making mistakes and all this type of stuff but I mean for years I didn't know who I was I didn't know what I stood for like I like you'll notice this as soon as we get a drink together over the over the summer I can be I'm incredibly camp right Mm -hmm. and that's just and I tried to hide that back I went about 10 years of my life speaking with a posh put on British accent because my mum and dad spoke a little bit like that. And where I grew up, I was the one that spoke a little bit posh. So I was like, you know what? Like, at least I can make people laugh with this. So I became a parody of myself, put on a fucking posh fake British accent for 10 yeah, yeah. years, spoke like that, um, got we into trouble. We play a part that we think is, you know, I would do that and I would be Keegan, oh, is, Keegan's the life and soul of the party is, you know, because at six foot four, somehow sometimes doing certain things that other people do becomes a lot funnier when a big, big fuck. <laughs> Uh, you know running and throwing yourself around or whatever being pissed and it was like it was all a front it was all a facade it was all a everybody please look at the shiny exterior because if you actually see what's going on underneath you will see i'm a crippled mess you know with everything that's going on and um, so yeah we, we play this part and we play this role and it's and and everybody who's listening to this will know that it, it, maybe they're not there themselves yet maybe they are they the will have definitely met somebody and you instantly like them. And the reason that you like them is because they are completely comfortable with who they are. Yeah. There's no pretense. They don't care. Like you say, one of my best mates, uh, straight guy, amazing rugby player, campus Christmas, <laughs> um, but so comfortable with who he is. He knows he's a shit drinker. He knows he's, <laughs> he knows he's, you know, crap teeth. He knows that he's, you know, not the best looking lad. He knows that all, all his camp is, is a row of tents, but he's completely comfortable with that. He doesn't pretend to be anything else. And everybody is drawn to that. And when people are put, people maybe don't know why they don't relate to someone or don't get on with someone, but it's that, I, I, that's my opinion anyway, that, we we very you know we can sense things that we might not necessarily be able to logically compute or uh you know talk about but it's yeah for me having that and when you meet someone it's like fuck yeah they've got it going on even if they, they might not be particularly successful they might not be but they're just comfortable with who they are and i think that's what we should all strive to be that for me that's what success is being completely at ease with who you are knowing that you're allowed to want things that maybe other people don't want and and, and be okay with it. Yeah, and, and again, it's the exact same thing, like I said with you, like, again, I'm very fortunate that, you know, it was probably just the same as what a lot of people go through, you know, not knowing who they are, not having this identity, not having this awareness, but like, I'm, I'm almost, not that I don't hold any regrets for it, because I'm, I'm happier now, more confident, like more accepting than than I've ever been before in my life. And I know my purpose and I know exactly who I am. I don't give a fuck. I don't care what anyone thinks. Like mm-hmm. if I say something that come, uh, comes across as camp, I don't fucking care, you know? And I think it's so important, but part of me angers me a little bit, not in myself, but just in society as a whole, that like, this is what so many people are struggling with. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, it comes down to social media. Yeah, it comes down to historical values and all this type of stuff. But I just find it so sad that people feel as if they need to try and be someone else. And, for anyone listening to this again like i would have been listening to this five years ago and be like what is this prick going on about like dan's fucking <laughs> dan's from god dan's all spiritual and all this type of stuff now but it's just that i don't care what anyone else thinks anymore yeah, and yeah. i know that happiness comes from being totally accepted and again like that was the main reason that i got into exercise initially was because you know i wanted to be bigger i wanted to bulk up and all this type of yeah, thing yeah. but 
once I got to that size and shape that I thought I wanted to be, that was the most self-conscious I've ever been. Yeah, yeah. But there's that thing, I don't know if you've seen it, that goes around the internet where people are training and it says, what do we want bigger muscles and what are we going to do with them? Hide our feelings in them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and it's, and so many people, so many people do that. Not Some people do it with a six pack. Some people do it with an amazing job. Some people do it with a, a, a really good looking partner, a Rolex or a, 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 a facade. There's some kind of facade that people hide behind. And, you know, I think once you figure out why they're doing that and they can realize that and accept it and work on it, the, 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 and everybody's potential is endless. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm not now, but I always used to think I was a, a, a scrubber who grew up on a council estate, you know, a single parent family, mum was on benefits. And now, you know, I live in a, a nice, a, a nice village in a nice house. I drive a nice car. I, I have a, a good job that fulfills me that I'm happy with, that I have a perfect, I never, I'm, I'm an out gay man. Um, mm -hmm. I never thought that that was something that I could have or something that I could be because of where I came from. And I would try and hide behind, you know, a bit more money or a bit more. I mean, when you take that away, you, you, all we're all left with is looking at the person in the mirror. And, you know, could you sit and look at yourself in the mirror for 10 minutes and be okay with that person? And when you can, you're probably in a really good spot, but a lot of people can. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. I love that looking in the, ten, in the mirror for 10 minutes thing. Um, when I go and teach my award, um, the people who've been put through it already, the main thing that we speak about when we talk about promoting positive mental health comes from education. Mm. And it, when, so for, to use the mental health example, people aren't educated enough on it. Um, yeah. This then directly breeds stigma. Um, lack of acceptance and one of the main things that individuals struggle mentally will have in common is lack of self-worth lack of confidence because they've been led to believe that they're different or that there's something wrong with them or that they are not normal and this is where it stems from if your environment growing up was maybe different like if there was if there was not to suggest there was they were uneducated but if there was more education on homosexuality and all this type of stuff I believe that would have been very different from you. Leading on yeah. from that, do you feel that your the depression that you went through and all the, the, the serious thoughts you went through, like potentially wanting to commit suicide and this type of thing, did they stem, although there's a lot of factors, do you feel as if they directly stemmed from you not accepting yourself? Yeah, 100%. 100%. And, you know, it's, it, it, I think it's really important that you've touched on education there because for me everything starts with education I, I i wouldn't say i'm particularly political but i always remember as a kid um, when tony blair was getting voted in and all used to this thick slogan was education 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 right <laughs> and i don't know why i don't know why that has always stuck with me i've always thought school's really important i've always thought learning's really important even coming out like i said earlier i i've had a good education i know about the Stonewall riots, I know about the movements, I know when the first Pride was, I know why it was, what it was, who were important figures in throughout history, why things are like they are. For me, when you can understand, uh, ig ignorance, self-acceptance is ignorance, right? It's ignorance of who you are, of, of, what, of what you want and, and why you want it. And for me, any form of ignorance is Ignorance and bias are derived from a lack of understanding and a lack of a lack of information and a lack of knowledge. So if we can fill that gap, whether that's around values, around mental health, around gay rights, around whatever, even around money, like there's so much stigma around money, especially like where you know me growing, money was bad, rich people are bad, blah 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 blah. So many people think that there's this. Because we're not we're not taught about it as kids. No one's taught about a tax return. No one's taught about <laughs> it. like you're not. So you're terrified of it. So you make judgments about things that you're terrified of. Um, and yeah, and that's where that self acceptance. Because there there are a lot of people who who do want to earn a lot of money and are scared to say that they want to do it because they're terrified of what other people will think of them for doing it. And it's all from a lack of edu a lack of education. So. I, I, yeah, I do think it's all rooted from that self-acceptance. And I do think any form of acceptance of anything, self-acceptance or, or other things, I'm not saying that you have to agree with it, agree with everything that you're educated on, but you know, as, as human beings, we have the ability to agree to disagree, but to understand and see somebody else's point. 
you know, for me, when you, as you grow up, you start out really certain in your early 20s. You know everything. This is this. And then as you get more information, you become wiser. You become less less sure of things, right? Because you're like, well, actually, it's not. It's that you lose that black and white thinking. So, yeah, for me, any kind of lack of acceptance or understanding is derived from a lack of education. Yeah. Yeah. And again, but I've, well, talking about this guy up here, like the Dalai Lama, that I've obviously, like a lot of people think I'm getting it screaming spiritual, but I'm not. It's, for me, education is massively important because, and this is what he says in his book, it's, I'm not, I don't educate myself or learn in order to be educated, well educated. I educate in order to be a better person and in order to help to help other people yeah. more. And again, it just comes down to that, having that empathy and then understanding. And if maybe that was more prevalent in your early life, then it might not have led on to you feeling as if there was something wrong with you and having this, you know, this internal dialogue of, of lack of self, self-acceptance. When we touched on the, um, if you don't mind talking about it, at the time when, when you felt as if you did want to take your own life, Again, I touched on earlier that I'm very fortunate enough that I've, I've never experienced anything like that. You know, we, we've all had low days and we can feel, I think I could relate to what that may feel coming from when I have felt the worst emotions ever. And then again, that must then just end up for, for people with depression being on like, you know, a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you know, constantly and not being able to, to get out of that. When I first started doing work around suicide prevention and this type of thing, the first thing that always comes up is individuals say, how could they do that? How Mm. could they do that to, they have a family. Mm. And then I just turned it around. I said, right, okay, well, if they're leaving the family behind, if they're leaving the kids behind, if they are knowledgeably doing this, surely that shows that we don't have a fucking clue how they're feeling. Yeah. Let's flip it on its head. It's not that like, how could they do that in the noise of leaving people behind? How the fuck could, how, we don't have a clue what they're potentially experiencing if they feel that there is their only way out. If you don't mind talking about when you were in that position, because again, let's bring this back to education. People might not be able to empathize or people might not be able to understand if they've not felt that way. In that moment, can you talk us through what the emotions were and what that feeling was like and, and what led you to feel as if this was the only way out? Yeah, absolutely. So I, and I, and I would have, and I would have agreed with that. And I suppose even still maybe part of me wonders that, you know, a, a lad who I knew growing up at school, his dad uh, committed suicide. And I remember, like, I remember my mum saying that's the most selfish thing somebody could do and da 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 For me, when I got to that point, I, I felt like I had tried, I hadn't, but I felt like I had exhausted every possible way to get out of that situation. I hadn't, and you know, something that uh, my friend does a lot of me- work with uh, mental health stuff with, with the military, and he, he talks about it being a permanent uh, solution to a, an impermanent problem. And for me, it was like that was that just seemed like the logical next step, right? You've tried this, this, and this, they didn't work, that's all that's left here. And again, that was again, that was probably from a lack of uh, knowing what was available to me. And I thought that I was, I would, I was, like I said earlier when we spoke, I was such a horrendous human being at that point. It's something that, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of myself. I wasn't a good father. I was a horrendous husband. I, I, I wasn't a good man. I wasn't a good member of society. I, I can't be nice to be around. I was, I was so uh, insular and just did things that I wanted to do for me to, for some kind of escapism. So I didn't have to deal with what was going on in my own head. So for me, I knew at that time that I wasn't a, a nice person. So by me not being there, I was actually doing people a favor. Yeah. Um, you know, I was doing, it, it seemed like that would be the quickest and easiest way to fix my problem and everybody else's problem at the same time. Efficient. And I'm all about efficiency. Um, so, you know, and that, and I guess that I, I, I was thinking it, you know, even saying that joking a little bit, I was thinking about it as a pragmatic, it was a pragmatic solution to a problem that dealt with everything. Was it ideal? Well, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been ideal for me and it wouldn't have been ideal for, for the kids afterwards, but I felt that it would, it was, it would have improved the situation as it was, uh, you know, and I'd always thought, you know, it's, it's really selfish for someone to do that. But as you said there, Dan, if someone gets to a point where 
they think that the single only conceivable point, way out is is to is to take their own life and th- i think there's a very big difference as well between someone who takes their own life and someone who tries to take their own life yeah. um because you know some people do it as a cry for help and they don't actually want to die i think you know i wasn't going to mess around with m- leaving it to chance with some pills or you know d- d- doing something else i knew that, that how i thought about doing it it was going to work so I think there is a difference between that, whether it being a cry for help and really doing it. But yeah, I, I, I guess I just thought it was the pragmatic solution. I was people would be better off without me. Was mm-hmm. their life would be better? That's how much I felt. I guess that's how unworthy or or un, how shit I felt about myself at the time was that I, I, people would actually be better off if I wasn't here anymore. Yeah, and that's when it could come down to, and if, if these individuals generally feel themselves in way about themselves, and you, you, you're quite open and honest about it. You're kind of like, I was a bit of a dick, <laughs> and that's almost yeah, right. Yeah. I hate myself, but these individuals may resent themselves that much that it's, it's a similar yeah. experience they feel. Yeah, exactly. That. I definitely did at the time, yeah. Yeah. No, no th- thanks for going through all of that. And after, when you decided not to go ahead with it, there was, did you notice... At that time, there was a notable, a noticeable switch because even just the fact you had then emotionally and psychologically committed to staying on this planet, yeah. did you feel as if there was a switch then, or did you feel as if then it was a little bit more gradual? Yeah, I think it was a bit more gradual, but I feel like that was definitely the rock bottom, and then it was like I, only based you know, up, I yeah, can work my way out of here, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it became like I don't, and that that was when it was like I don't want my kids to. I didn't want my kids to to not grow up without a dad. And then it was like, okay, what else don't I want? I don't want my kids to see that this is a relationship. Okay, I don't want my kids to feel like the dad's an asshole. So then it, it, you know, as we know as coaches, pain will get somebody started on the journey because you want to move away from that pain. And that got me moving in the right direction. And then, but that will only get you so far. And then you've got to see the. The, the goal at the end of what was possible um, to keep you going. So yeah, it, I wouldn't say it was like a, right, I'm going to turn everything around and this is it. It wasn't like an epiphany moment for me, but it was certainly the the beginning of things getting better. Yeah. What do you, who do you thank and what do you thank for helping you on that journey? Now, first of all, like yourself, of course, for being able to change your behaviors. When it comes to that internalization behavior, change your behaviors, um, you wanted to change, but what other either resources or what other tools or what sort of things could you recommend to anyone else? Or would, would you thank for, can we call it recovery with, with that recovery process? Yeah, I guess, I guess it was recovery. Yeah. I mean, so I've done, I've done lots of stuff for my mental, mental health, not necessarily off the back of that, but after coming out, I went and saw a counselor, um, honestly, the best thing I've ever done. Um, and I remember as a rugby player, I was thinking, probably should see somebody but I don't want to because you know it's going to make me look like I'm I'm weak or I've not got it figured out or especially after I've come out and I've got some notes to write what people find out that I'm you know I'm a I felt like I was fucked or or in the head or whatever and I remember talking to one of the rugby lads about it and he because he'd seen a counsellor and I actually saw the same counsellor as him and I said how are you feeling about that like is it you know is it kind of emasculated you is it um I probably didn't say emasculated to him um, but <laughs> and he said he said you know what Keys I feel really good about it because when we've got a knock we go see the fizz right we go see the physio I've hurt my shoulder we're not happy about it but we know that we need to get it fixed and we're not ashamed that we've hurt our shoulder are we? so why should I be ashamed that I need somebody to fix my head and that I thought that was a really good way of looking at it and and I saw the counsellor and I've always been really open and honest about it genuinely the best ex- experience that I've, I've, I've ever done for my mental health and it's something that I continue now. I still I see a council every two weeks just to keep in check with everything. And um, I think, yeah, for me, that was good. I started, I started meditating. I just started doing little things to look after my mental health. Started meditating, you know, just five, 10 minutes a day. Journaling for me has been really important. I also did, there's a guy called John D. Martini who did a, who does a call, who did some courses and he talks about values a lot. And a big thing for me that has really helped me, you talk, you talk there, about, Dan, about being grateful or being thankful for certain things. I used to really resent my mum 
um, because she wasn't very emotional when they were growing up. There was, it wasn't a very I love you house. It was a, you know, shut the fuck up, get out of face kind of house. And it wasn't a particularly nice environment to grow up in. And I always thought it's your fault that I'm struggling with this because I, I don't know how to deal with my emotions and da 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 da. And then when I, I remember went on this course and it was uh, it was talking about finding gratitude in the things that have happened to you that you feel are horrendous. Yeah. And it was, so for me, it was that. And, you know, looking at the positives of that, it made me really resilient. It made me really strong-willed, able to get through stuff. It made me able to deal with challenges. It made me independent. Um, you know, so many things that I'm now grateful that I am, that I used to resent and felt that that got me, you know, even stuff like my dad not being around, I used to think, oh, you know, I've missed out on all this thing and you've had this impact. <laughs> if, if I don't believe that's the case, I used to think it was like a nurture thing and my dad not being there, that's why I was gay. I don't, that's not the case. Um, but, you know, even being thankful for, you know, I am who I am and you, I don't, I know that I don't need somebody else to feel valued. So lots of things that I've done to work, to, to work on it. And it's been, a, it, progress is a slow process, right? It takes time. Um, but it, it compounds over time and it's, it is, it's absolutely worth it for the investment, the time, energy, money, um, absolutely worth it. Yeah, amazing. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that I actually, I, I didn't plan on asking about this, but I thought about this when we first started talking. Um, one of probably the most recent and well-publicized stories uh, about somebody coming out was with Philip Schofield, right? And I remember when that first came out and me and Amy were sitting and um, we were watching this morning, we were watching it. And I was just like, I, I was like, I just think this is so amazing. I was like, this is absolutely incredible. You then go online. I don't watch the news, right? And I, I just don't let myself get yeah, in, impacted by any of that. But we did because it was a big story. I was like, I'm interested in this. Yeah. And the amount of abuse and hate that he received, how can he put his, how could he have put his wife through this for all this time? He's been sitting on this. He's been having an affair. How could he do this to his kids? It just it it blew it absolutely blew my mind. What was what was your um your take on that when that all unfolded? Yeah, I mean, I I I, I remember putting a post out and it was you know I think I ended up going on BBC and talking about it, but it was like uh, I love how you just like I think I went on the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> might might you have? I was so busy that day. Lots of other stuff happened. <laughs> um, but. It, I, I, everybody wants other gays opinions on the gays it was yeah it was like the, th the thing that I realized with coming out is it's there's no right or wrong way to do it yes I in an ideal world you wouldn't get married to a woman and have kids but if we all make the decisions based on what we think is best at the time nobody I, I, unless you like malicious or whatever, you don't think I'm going to make a decision that's going to fuck people over as much as possible. You think that it's the best solution to the problem at the time. It might not be, but you know, with the tools that you've got at the time, you make that decision. So coming out is a very individual thing. You know, people have always said, you know what, professional footballers, why do you, you know, you should tell them to come out. And I was like, that's not my place. You know, you have to be completely comfortable with where you're at. We've just spoke about self-acceptance and you absolutely have to be that. So it obviously, you know, and Phil, Phil Schofield is a generation behind me. He must, if he was a, a closeted gay man growing up while everybody's dropping dead of AIDS, um, like that must have been terrifying in itself. Why would he want to expose himself to that? Why would he want to, you know, why would, if you've got a, I would say if you come out and you come out to 10 people, 20 people, that's your friends and family, that's difficult enough. If you're in the, any kind of limelight, you know, and you've got a big following or whatever, him coming out, like you've just said, they've done all the stuff that he got. You're exposing yourself to that. Who wants to do that? So yeah. sometimes it's, we all, it's easy to bury our head in the sand, right? And it's not condoning it or saying it's the right thing, but it's understandable why people might do it. And, you know, it's amazing. People put up, you know, the BBC puts a post on about, you know, Pride Day or Coming Out Day or whatever it is. And the amount of abuse that people get I, it, it, uh, the people post is just like yeah it, it just shows how uneducated people are and, and it's not their fault they're just not educated they've yeah. just not been it, it's, it's you don't shout at a kid for not knowing how to write because they've not been taught how to do it so although you know sometimes you expect a 30 year old with two kids to have a little bit more gumption about them but if they grew up where, somewhere where I grew up then they may never have come across a gay person in their life and like I said you know people are scared of what they don't understand yeah. 
And I, I think it just comes down to like society and like who we are kind of as, as people as well. You'll deal with this a lot more. Your, your following is a lot is a lot bigger on than mine, but I've got an okay following on Facebook. I've got like 20 or thousand on, on Facebook and I put out a test one day because I was just pissed off for people arguing on my posts, right? Because you know what happens once you start to build up like a little bit of a following, then it, like your posts are a place for other people to chat, <laughs> right? So, and again, because the nature of what I talk about, I noticed over the course of like a year, my Facebook was just becoming place yeah, a place for people to to argue right so one day i was like fuck you all argue about this and i just put up a picture of a llama right and i was like find some find something negative to talk about this and then two people ended up arguing on the post right i've um i follow you on instagram and i absolutely love your posts and they're absolutely incredible and i love the conviction that you have the the sort of the mission statement that you have in your own head about what you have but also i really love how you articulate stuff as well but your Instagram comments are like a feeding ground <laughs> sometimes for debate and people arguing. How do you how do you make sure that you're not attached to that? Because what, what I've done, I actually have one of my members of staff runs my Facebook now and mm -hmm. he replies to stuff and he comments. So I was like, I need to step away from that, especially yeah, when yeah. I was when I put my award out there. My award was based on ads. So I was getting random people commenting. And I was got random people giving me abuse. Mm -hmm. how, how the fuck can you um, be promoting positive mental health? You're not a licensed therapist, all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. and you're a fraud and um, all this type of stuff. And I was taking it so personally. I felt as if, although I have so much awareness, I still couldn't make that emotional disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel as if you can cope with that? Because you'll actively reply to people and engage with people on, on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. How are you able to keep that um, level of conviction and, and clear head, keep a clear head in order to articulate and then also not be overly affected by it? Yeah. Um, so I, probably a, a lot of it's come from Anthony. So Anthony is my best mate. He's in, he's in action Coronation Street. He plays Sean in Coronation Street and he's been called a, a faggot every day for the last however many years. And, you know, I, I've spoken to him about this, you know, and he's got so much abuse online and it doesn't generally look at it, but it's like, you know, how do you, you know, deal with it? And, you know, and something Ant said to me, he said, yeah, it affects me sometimes. He said, but there's a quote by George Bernard Shaw, don't wrestle with pigs because when you do, you'll get dirty. And by the way, the pigs like it. Um, so, so I've always, I've always, I've always had that. I, I'm a booker for a quote and I've, I really like that one. And I just, even when I speak to somebody, if I realize that there's no, um, and sometimes I'll speak to people and then it'll become a, a DM conversation. Um, and when, at the point when I realized it's just doing it for the sake of an argument, that's when I would disengage. But if, you know, if someone, it, it, it would, you know, people might say, oh, you should just ignore it. But I don't think, for me, that doesn't change anything. They'll, if, 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 they're un uned, if they're uneducated, then they'll still be uneducated, you know, whereas at least if they're a twat, you can find out that they're a twat and there's no chance that you can change them. So, but, you know, not everybody who's uneducated is, there's a difference between ignorance and willful ignorance. Yeah. Um, and if somebody is ignorant because they've not been educated, but they are willing to be educated, then for me, I feel, whether rightly or wrongly, that I'm in a position where I can do that. Sometimes I do do it, sometimes I don't do it. But I feel that that's my job to to do that i don't know if i've maybe taken on too much there but yeah that's how i kind of think about it yeah 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 no that makes sense so um i feel as if i could chat to you all day um i am um, just from my personal perspective like i'm incredibly proud of everything that you've done and especially obviously because me and keegan are, i'm very fortunate enough that i could potentially chat to you a couple of times a week within power room and that type of thing and um, the main thing for me that i can see is your vision and what it is that you want to achieve and your passion behind that. So for anyone listening, do you just want to give a quick overview on what it is that you want to achieve with regards to your own business? But I suppose we can call it a movement as well that, that you've got. Um, where you see that going over the course of the next couple, couple of years and what you'd like to achieve? Yeah, so for me, the community has been so important in my life, whether that's been a rugby player coming out, uh, having that support network. And there's so many gay men who go through what I've gone, not what I've gone through, but similar struggle with self-acceptance, not having somebody there to believe in them. And plus all the stuff of wanting to feel good in their own skin and like the body that they're in. 
so, which again is something that I've struggled with. So what I've created is, you know, PTIQ is my um, coaching program. You know, it's a, it's for me, it's like a one-stop shop for people to build a, a, you know, an incredible body, a rock solid mindset and the confidence so they can live life on their terms. And for me, I want it to be a place where, I want it to be the place where gay men can go and say, I want to fucking level up. I want to be better. I want to fulfill my potential. And that's what PTIQ is. That it's, I'm surrounded by people who want the same, people who understand my experience of the world. You know, it's, and I have clients who are straight, you know, who, who buy into it, who want to be better and, and things like that. But it's it's done through the lens of a gay man for gay men to to conquer the things that they feel get in the way, and 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 that's what that is, and that's what I want I want it to be. I want it to be the premier place for for gay men to to be able to fulfil the potential. Yeah, it's amazing. And again, you made a brilliant point there. It's not yet. It's the it, the theme is gay men, but that's not, that isn't the purpose when you strip it back. The purpose is self-acceptance. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, Brian, absolutely love that. Um, Keegan, for anyone that doesn't know you, um, if anyone would like to find out a little bit more um, about you, hopefully in a couple of years time, Keegan will be able to say there's a book or something. Um, at the moment, if people want to find out more about you and your story, where um, where can they find you? Um, they can give us a follow on Instagram, Keegan Erst, um, Twitter, same um other than that there's a ted talk i did a ted talk and um, check that out um that's called a talk on hope um yeah other than that um don't watch first dates <laughs> <laughs> um i've watched the ted talk and it's inspiring it's absolutely incredible so guys go check that out um keegan thank you so much on my end again like i'm very very fortunate enough to uh, be privileged actually to, to call you a friend and um, thank you so much for coming and doing this and on my end again with although our mission statements are different we've got the exact same purpose and it's to help people feel accepted and um, help people be comfortable who they are and realize their true potential and i just think what you're doing is absolutely incredible um, and i can't thank you enough for that so yes thank you for coming on and telling the guys about your story no amazing mate thank you for having me i really appreciate that and i appreciate your friendship and your support as as you have mine and i'm looking forward to doing the course <laughs> awesome bro thank you Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to that and a massive thank you to Keegan for taking part as well. Guys, hope you enjoyed. If you aren't already, please follow me on Facebook at Dan Hancock for Mental Health PT or Instagram at Mental Health PT or please follow us on YouTube as well if you aren't already. Until next time, take care.